Hi there, my name's Bruce Rain from Brankus Creations, and in this video I'll be talking about ultrasonic cleaners, what they are, how they work, and what they can be used for. I'll also be going through the steps I took to make this DIY ultrasonic cleaner. Just a reminder to press the like button if you enjoy this video and please consider subscribing to my channel. So, how does an ultrasonic cleaner work? An ultrasonic cleaner passes high frequency sound waves through liquid, which creates a reaction called cavitation. But more on that in a moment. Let's talk about sound waves first. Sound travels in waves. There are low frequency sound waves. And there are high frequency sound waves. These waves are measured in hertz. One hertz is equivalent to one wave cycle per second. Humans can hear sounds from around 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, or 20 kilohertz. Though this audible range does depend a lot on the hearing of the individual. You're currently hearing the sound of my voice at around 100 hertz. If a high frequency sound gets high enough, it actually goes beyond the ability of the human ear to hear it. And this is called ultrasonic sound. So when we're talking about an ultrasonic cleaner, it's using sound waves that are at a frequency above 20 kilohertz. Otherwise, it would just be a sonic cleaner. As to exactly what frequency an ultrasonic cleaner uses, that depends a lot on the cleaner itself. Most of these low-end consumer cleaners use 40 kilohertz sound waves. Some expensive cleaners can actually cycle through different wavelengths to improve their cleaning efficiency. So how does this actually clean stuff? Well, a very interesting thing happens when you pass ultrasonic sound waves through liquid. The process forms microscopic bubbles that grow to a certain size and then collapse, causing a tiny shock wave. This shock wave helps to dislodge particles of dirt and grime on the surface of anything you submerge into the liquid. The size of the bubbles depends on the ultrasonic frequency. Higher frequencies produce smaller bubbles. You can also heat up the liquid and add some detergent to make the cleaner even more effective. I won't go too far into the science of ultrasonic cleaning, mainly because of my limited knowledge on the subject, but if you would like to delve deeper, I recommend this excellent video by Hamster Time. You may have seen some videos on YouTube where people demonstrate making their own ultrasonic cleaner using an orbital sander taped to a bucket of water or something like that. They switch on the sander, it vibrates, then they demonstrate it cleaning something to prove to you that it's working. These are not really ultrasonic cleaners. They might clean things, but they are doing this with movement or agitation in the same way that a washing machine works. But they're not ultrasonic and they're not creating cavitation. There's a really easy way to test if you're actually ultrasonically cleaning, but we'll get to that a little later in the video. Ultrasonic cleaners come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Some of the smaller units are designed for cleaning things like items of jewelry, but there are much larger units that can clean big things, like the engine block of a truck. There's no real limit to how small or how big an ultrasonic cleaner can actually be. The great thing about ultrasonic cleaners is that they can clean in very fine cracks and crevices. Plus, they are incredibly gentle. This is why I use an ultrasonic cleaner for cleaning electronics. Now it might seem very counterintuitive to be cleaning electronics in liquid, but as long as there's no power running through the device while it's being cleaned, and as long as it gets completely dry afterwards, it's actually incredibly effective. Once upon a time, ultrasonic cleaners were very specialized and very expensive. But these days, there is a range of inexpensive consumer level cleaners available to buy. When you buy a cleaner, you'll find that most of them are identified by their capacity or how much liquid they hold. They are also identified by how many watts of power they clean with. This will then allow you to calculate how powerful they are in relation to their capacity. For example, this is a 10 litre cleaner. It has 200 watts of cleaning power. That means it has around 20 watts of cleaning power per litre. However, even though this is sold as a 10 litre cleaner, it's not actually practical to fill it right to the very top. So it holds more like 8 litres, which means it has 25 watts per litre. This can be converted to around 95 watts per gallon. 
It's my understanding that for these smaller bench cleaners, around 100 watts per gallon is ideal. If you go too high, it can actually result in unwanted erosion. So it's not just a matter of cranking up the power as high as possible. Inside this cleaner are four 50 watt ultrasonic emitters or transducers. And they're stuck to the bottom of this stainless steel tank. And we'll talk about them some more a little later. Cleaners like this usually have a removable basket to keep the items being cleaned elevated from the bottom of the tank. That's because an ultrasonic cleaner won't clean as effectively if the item is resting on the bottom. The baskets also aid in retrieving and draining the cleaned items. Some people might tell you that it's necessary to fork out loads of money for a top of the line cleaner, but they're probably just saying that because they're upset they paid too much for theirs. In my experience, some of these cheap little units are incredibly effective. I purchased this Vivor brand cleaner on eBay in 2017 for 160 Australian dollars and it's been excellent. There are others that look exactly like it, but I couldn't actually tell you if they're built well. My friend Steve from the Mac84 YouTube channel purchased a 15 litre T-Bond ultrasonic cleaner, which didn't work when it arrived. He was instructed by the seller to make some modifications that eventually got it working. Certainly not a good recommendation for their quality control practices. This cleaner has a power switch, a thermostat control, and a timer. So I can set the temperature for the liquid and it keeps it pretty well, though sometimes the liquid does get a little hotter than the set temperature. I usually set it to 45 degrees Celsius, which is suitable for the cleaning solution I use and the electronic components I typically clean. When I want to clean something, I submerge it in the liquid, set the cleaning time, then press OK. This starts the countdown and will switch off the cleaner automatically once the timer reaches zero. As for the liquid inside the cleaner, I always use distilled water. Normal tap water has lots of impurities and minerals. Although it might clean the board well, once the board has been dried off, these impurities can be left on the board and could accelerate future corrosion. For the cleaning detergent, I use a product called Electro which is made by a company called Cleantech here in Australia. It's specifically designed to help remove dirt and flux while remaining gentle on the board, the metals and components. While I have heard that you can use virtually any form of detergent, including dish soap, I really can't say whether this might damage some delicate components or have some long-term issues, such as accelerating future corrosion. If you want to save a few dollars, by all means, use whatever detergent you like. But I'm going to stick with this stuff. As far as I know, Electro is only available here in Australia. But my US friends tell me that Branson EC cleaning fluid is quite good as well. I did also try a product called Ambersil, but I found it to be too harsh. This detergent gets diluted in the distilled water at one part per ten parts water. So if I put in five litres of water, I put in 500 millilitres of detergent. I generally replace the liquid once it starts to get murky and grey. This cleaner has a tap on the side to simplify the process of emptying the tank. I have heard that you should allow a freshly filled ultrasonic cleaner time to degas, to allow any air in the water to dissipate. But this only applies to water that has been pressurized. I've never really bothered with degassing using bottled distilled water, but if you want to, running the cleaner for 10 to 15 minutes without anything in the liquid should be enough to do it. It only needs to be done after refilling with fresh liquid. When deciding which cleaner to buy, make sure you choose one with a timer and a heater. But one of the most important things is to get one that is the right size for the things you want to clean. For example, here is a Macintosh Classic motherboard. As you can see, it fits in the cleaner perfectly. As for cleaning times, that varies based on the cleaner, the detergent, and just how dirty the item you're cleaning is. If I'm cleaning a motherboard like this, I usually clean it for about 10 minutes per side, though I may go up to 25 minutes if it's really old and crusty. Once the board has been cleaned, I then remove it from the cleaner, let it drain for a moment, and then rinse it in 100% isopropyl alcohol. I do know some people who rinse with distilled water instead, but I use alcohol because it speeds up the drying process. Once it's rinsed, I let the excess alcohol drip off the board, then I dry it. 
You can dry it under the sun, but if you want to speed up the process, you can dry it in your household oven. But you must be able to set your oven at really low temperatures, which pretty much rules out the use of a gas oven. I use this little toaster oven that I picked up from Goodwill for about $30. I set the oven temperature at about 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, but for some boards you can go higher. Many of these vintage PCBs that I work on have plastic parts on them that can melt quite easily, so I'd rather go low and slow. I let the board dry for about an hour, and then once it's cooled, it's ready for use. I use my ultrasonic cleaner for electronics, but you can clean virtually anything, as long as it doesn't mind getting wet. You can clean jewellery, clothes, car parts, tools, dentures, weapons, pretty much any hard, non-absorbent material. Be aware that some electronic components are sensitive to ultrasonic sound waves, such as gyroscopes, accelerometers and microphones, so don't use an ultrasonic cleaner for these. And sometimes ultrasonic cleaners can have a strange reaction with aluminium, or aluminium for my Northern Hemisphere friends. It doesn't seem to damage it, it just slightly tarnishes the surface. So this cleaner is perfect for a little Mac Classic motherboard like this. But for a Quadra 950 motherboard, not so much. One of the problems I've had is that as these cleaners go up in size, they get a little larger in each of the three dimensions. A little wider, a little deeper, and a little taller. Even if I were to purchase a 30 litre cleaner, three times the size of this one, I still can't fit this long flat board into it, which has always frustrated me. What I needed was a very wide and very shallow cleaner to take these larger motherboards, and this is why I decided to make my own. The very first thing I had to do was find a suitable tank. It would need to be the right size, reasonably strong, made of stainless steel, and have a lid. And that's when I went to the kitchen supplies shop. Professional kitchens use large trays like this for serving food. They use a European sizing standard called gastronorm. When you're standing at the buffet and you see all those metal dishes with food in it, the size of those dishes is given in relation to one gastronorm, which is 530mm by 325mm. So smaller trays come in a range of sizes, such as half, third or quarter gastronorm. For my purposes, one gastronorm was almost perfect. In truth, it would have been better if it was about 20mm wider, but it would do. I purchased a nice, solid, good quality tray that was about 160 millimeters deep, and I also purchased a flat lid. All up, these cost me about 80 Australian dollars delivered. I measured the interior of the tray and calculated that it would hold around 16 liters when filled to this line. This is around 4.2 gallons. So based on the 100 watts per gallon rule, I would need around 420 watts of ultrasonic power. Most of the standard ultrasonic transducers are 50 watts each, so I would need 8 of them in order to get 400 watts. Websites like Banggood, AliExpress and eBay all have kits you can buy with transducers and power supplies or drivers. I opted for a kit with two 50 watt transducers and a single 100 watt driver. I purchased four of these kits from AliExpress, which cost around 255 Australian dollars and took around three weeks to arrive. If you're buying them, make sure you get the right voltage driver. In my part of the world, we use 240 volt AC power. When the kits arrived, I was pleased to see that the drivers were actually 120 watts. So my hope was that they might be a little more resilient. On the negative side, they looked like they'd been soldered by a child, so I had real concerns about whether they would work at all. Now that I had everything I needed to make them work, I set about building the cleaner. The first step was to measure out the bottom of the tray so that the transducers could be positioned at equal distances from each other. The kits had these little screw-in bolt thingies with absolutely no instructions on what they were, what they did, or if they were needed. In the end, I decided to use them as a locator for positioning the transducers, which I'll show in a moment. I have since found out that these little bolts are meant to be argon welded to the stainless steel tub. Then the transducer is glued and screwed onto the bolt. I do have a welder, but it's a gasless MIG, and with my questionable welding skills, I would have no chance of welding to metal so thin. 
So I went with glue. This realization explains some of the problems I encountered further down the track. Once I had marked out the transducer locations, I prepped the surface of the metal with some fine sandpaper. I wanted to create some grooves in the metal to assist in the glue adhesion. I used a very fine grit sandpaper, though I think that was a mistake. More on that later. I then used some 100% isopropyl alcohol to clean the surface thoroughly to prep for the glue. The transducers were already clean and came with some sort of grey primer on the surface to help with the glue adhesion. I decided to use JB Weld, which is a very strong epoxy adhesive. I thought it would probably make more sense to use a silicon adhesive, as they have some flex and adhere to smooth surfaces incredibly well. But everywhere I looked, people seemed to be using solid epoxy, so I decided to do the same. Apparently, the flexibility of silicon adhesive can absorb some of the vibrations, reducing the efficiency of the transducer. JB Weld comes in two parts. You mix together equal amounts thoroughly and the drying process begins. It usually takes around 18 to 24 hours to dry. I started by gluing the little bolts to the metal tray with a blob of JB Weld. My thinking was that I would then screw the transducers onto the bolts which would hold them firmly in position until the rest of the glue dried. So once the glue had dried on those little bolts, I then applied glue to the surface of the transducers and then screwed them down onto the bolts. I tightened them until the glue was oozing out the edges. I also think I screwed them down too tightly and squeezed out too much glue in the process. After 24 hours, it was time to wire up the transducers. As far as I could see, based on the wiring of other ultrasonic cleaners, it should be in parallel, not in series. So I began wiring them up. The instructions that came with the transducers said, and I quote, Vibration first two tabs, two ceramic middle lug is positive, by the upper and lower metal column is negative, cannot be reversed. So I took this to mean that the middle tab here should be wired to positive. However, the picture on their website had this wired as negative. I contacted the seller to confirm, and they assured me the picture was correct. After a little bit of experimenting, I found that the transducers seemed to work either way around. But I wired them up this way to be safe. This video won't be providing any instructions on wiring up the AC mains power to the drivers. This is because it's potentially deadly and I'm not qualified to be giving that sort of advice. I would recommend you find someone with the correct qualifications to help you with that part. Once they were all wired up, I decided to do a very quick test, just to see if they were all buzzing. It's not good to run them without water, so it was only for a few seconds. Success. In order for me to do a practical test, it would be necessary for me to fill the tray with water, which would involve building some sort of stand for it. I took a few measurements, bought some 9mm plywood, and started building a box. I had no idea how I should build it, so I just did the best I could. I used liquid nails adhesive and brad nails to hold it together while the glue dried. I also used a few extra pieces of wood to strengthen the box in the corners and across the middle. Most of the weight would be pushing straight down, so the box just needed enough strength to hold together. I also built a base that I could use to hold the drivers in place. I'm no carpenter, but I was pretty happy with the end result. I left the front open for easy access to the innards, as well as providing some cooling. I filled the tank with cleaning liquid, ready to test it out. Keep in mind that I didn't have any sort of timer, just a switch at the mains power. The timer can come later. It certainly sounded like it was working, but I had to check to be sure, and this is how you test if an ultrasonic cleaner is actually working. Grab yourself a sheet of aluminium or aluminium foil, place the foil in the liquid, and turn on the cleaner for 10 seconds. Take out the foil and hold it up to the light. You should see a bunch of pinholes in the foil. This is where those little shock waves have torn through the thin foil when the bubbles collapsed. If you don't see the holes, your ultrasonic ain't really an ultrasonic. During this first test, I also discovered how important it is to connect the tray to ground. Failure to do so can result in an uncomfortable shock. The next thing I did was purchase an immersion heater like this. 
although this doesn't give me thermostatic temperature control, it does allow me to get the liquid up to temp quite quickly. And while the cleaner is actually running, the cavitation tends to keep the liquid warm enough. Just make sure you don't leave this heater unattended, otherwise you might end up boiling the thing dry. I also use this little rack to place in the cleaner to keep the items being cleaned off the bottom. So now I started to put the cleaner into production. I do repairs to vintage Macintosh computers and I had plenty of boards to clean. I had the cleaner running hot and it was working beautifully for a little while. The first thing that happened was one of the transducers came unstuck from the bottom of the tray. I switched off the cleaner and grabbed the transducer and it was blazingly hot. I started to wonder whether the heat had weakened the glue, so I set about building a cooling system. Thankfully, I had two spare 240 volt AC fans left over from another project, so I repurposed them for this. I made a hinged door on the front of the cleaner with the two fans in place, then I drilled three large holes in the back of the box for the air to flow. I also added a separate switch for the fans so that I could keep them running even after the cleaning was finished. I drained the tank just by siphoning it into a 20 litre jerry can. Then I glued the transducer back to the tray. This time I used a much coarser sandpaper to create much more pronounced grooves in the metal. I then used acetone to clean the surface and I used a lot more glue to stick the transducer back on. Once the glue dried, I filled the tray back up with the liquid and started using it again. After a few cleans, I heard a pop and realized that one of the drivers had blown a fuse. I replaced the fuse, but it immediately blew again. So I removed the driver, which meant I was now down to only 300 watts of power, but it was still cleaning okay. I inspected the driver and it appeared that these two voltage regulators had blown, so I ordered some new ones. Maybe they were affected by the heat, maybe they were affected by the transducer falling off, maybe they were faulty, maybe they were low quality, who knows. After running the cleaner for a little while on six transducers, another transducer fell off, and then another. Okay, this is getting silly. Time to rip them all off and re-glue the lot of them. So I drained the tank and tried pulling the rest of the transducers off. Of the seven left from the original gluing, there were five still stuck on, and two of them popped off really easily. The remaining three weren't budging, so I decided to leave them as they were. I re-glued the four transducers as I had done with the first re-glue, coarser sandpaper, acetone to clean, and much more glue. After the glue dried, I put it all back together and continued with the three drivers while I waited for the replacement parts. After only a few cleans, I noticed that one of the other drivers wasn't working properly, though it was a different problem. It was running, but the transducers were barely making a sound. After inspecting that driver, I realized that this transformer was the problem. The enamel coating on the wire wrapped around the core had melted and was making contact with the wire next to it, rather than being insulated. The transformer had no markings on it, so I had no idea what to do about buying a replacement. So instead, I decided to unwrap the wire enough to put some new insulation on the exposed parts and then wrap it up again. Unbelievably, this worked. I was wondering if these problems were started while I was running the cleaner without fan cooling, or maybe it was just because it was built like garbage. I will certainly be trying to get some replacements from the seller to have as spares. By this time, my replacement transistors had arrived, so I repaired the other driver and was now back up to the full 400 watts. A little later, another of the drivers failed, though I believe this happened because I accidentally ran it without the fans one time. For this one, I had to completely unwrap one of the transformers and rewrap it with new wire. A few weeks later, another driver failed. It was the transformer again, but I completely destroyed it while trying to rewrap it. So I ordered another driver from AliExpress. I also installed this rotary timer. It allows me to turn the dial to a particular time and then it uses a clockwork mechanism to count down to zero, then switching off the cleaner. This timer has also allowed me to wire it up more sensibly. Before, it was technically possible for me to accidentally run it with the fans off. But with the addition of the timer, the main switch activates the fans and the timer activates the cleaning. It's now impossible to clean without the fans running. 
Only time will tell if there are more technical issues on the horizon, but it's been working flawlessly since I replaced the last driver and added the timer. I use this power monitor to make sure it's using the correct amount of watts. When it's working properly, it uses a little over 400 watts. If I see it dip down below 300 watts, I know something's wrong. So what have I learned from this exercise? If you can find an off-the-shelf option that meets your needs, take it. Building your own is fun, but it's also filled with challenges. I couldn't find a cleaner that suited my needs, so building my own was the only option. I have absolutely no regrets, and on the whole, I'm very happy with the cleaner. If you do decide to build your own, make sure you sand the surface of the tray with a coarse sandpaper to get some nice deep grooves for the glue to adhere, and don't get cheap with the amount of glue you use. If you have the means, weld those little bolts to the bottom of the tray, as that would definitely stop the transducers from falling off so easily. I also think it's a good idea to buy a spare driver, just in case one of the other ones fail. Recently, I've been investigating other driver brands to see if I can find ones that are more durable. Oh, and make sure you use fans for cooling. I think the heat during my early use was the cause for many of my later problems. And don't forget to ground the tray. If you do forget, you will get a very unpleasant sensation if you put your hand in the liquid while the cleaner is running. I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any feedback, please leave it in the comments. Please consider subscribing to my channel, and if you like the video, please give us a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.